Muy buenas tardes. Um, thank you all for coming. They have this huge auditorium, and uh, I, I think I've done this before, but I don't remember when. But in any case, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to come this afternoon and be here at NABE. Uh, my name is Gene Garcia, and uh, I'm scheduled to start at 1.40, so we'll try to do that because uh, other sessions will follow in uh, appropriate manner, and so we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, I, uh, again, am uh, very pleased to, to be here, always at NAVE, and to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing, uh, the kinds of things we're finding about bilingualism. Uh, some of you may know that my work is around, uh, really around research and theory related to uh, children who learn more than one language. And I've been at this for quite some time. Uh, and as, uh, as you know, if you stay at this long enough, people actually give you an award, and I was, I was uh, pleased to receive the Ramon Santiago Award in, uh, this morning, and, and I think it's probably the longevity. The longer you stay around, uh, the, the more you might get recognized. Not that you do anything important, it's just that you're still around. So very humbly, um, let me talk a little bit about our work and how it might relate to the kind of work you're doing with uh, bilingual children. Um, I start with the, with the idea that uh, that there has been a substantive landscape change. Um, some of you know that my work as a researcher is sometimes coupled with work as a policymaker. I had the privilege of going to Washington and working in Washington in the Clinton administration, uh, doing what um, Libby Gill will actually be talking about later after this session. She's now the director of OELA. I was the director of OBEMLA. But the intent of my going to Washington was try to translate uh, uh, what we know about research into, into so issues related to policy. And so I continue to, to try to do that and also try to translate what we know uh, uh, into what we might do in the classroom, in practice, what we might do at home with our parents and our families, because we have to see conceptually that all this is part of learning two languages. So I'll start with the idea that, that this, this broader set of learning talking about bilinguals is not just about language. I think those of us who are trained as psycholinguists uh, were very interested in the developmental aspects of language, linguistic, psycholinguistic aspects, even sociolinguistics. And so what I learned after many years of being in this field that it's not just about language. So I'm going to, so bear with me as I talk about language and being bilingual but also the other ramifications that relate to those children that we will call uh, bilingual. Um, first, I, I think I would say that uh, there's been a landscape change in how we deal with uh, bilingual children. Uh, certainly in my earlier work, we tried to identify that bilingualism wasn't a disadvantage. <laughs> I mean, think of that today and you say, my God, why would we ever start doing research to identify that bilingualism was a disadvantage. We should all know at our gut level that knowing two languages is a pretty good deal. In fact, we spent a lot of money at the university level requiring that everybody learn more than one language. But you gotta remember the field began in a very defensive posture. And so our work was around issues related to defending the existence of bilingual kids and that it wasn't a bad idea to have little children, students, and even Others who are into their adolescent years learn two languages. So I'm going to talk essentially about that landscape change. We've moved from that deficit notion, that disadvantage notion, and today I want to talk about the benefits of bilingual, because that's the, that's the, that is essentially what we're doing now in research. I would say 25 years ago when I began my work, we were defending bilingualism. Today, we're trying to identify all the multiple benefits of bilingualism. So it's an interesting landscape change. Now what helped in that landscape change was several things. One, the actual demography. In our work, we look at how, about how many babies are born in the United States whose moms speak a language other than English. Well, in 2013, the Center for Disease Control actually counts how many births there are in this country and has an identifying set of characteristics. In 2013, 27% of babies born in the United States were born to mothers who did not speak English as their primary language. Guess what? Those kids are going to be bilingual. Okay, they're going to be bilingual. They're born in the United States. By the way, they're U.S. citizens. They're exposed in a, to a very important, critical person in language development called mom. All right? And guess what mom's going to speak to that baby? 
don't speak her language. He's going to put, her, put them in an environment in which that language is all spoken, and they're going to be exposed to English. Can't help it. So they're going to be bilingual. In fact, we know through uh, demographic information that we've studied essentially that across the country, about 80% of our DLLs or ELLs, about 80% of our children essentially are really bilingual. They're not Spanish dominant or just Chinese dominant or Navajo dominant. They're exposed to two, if not more than two languages. They're really bilingual. And that's a major breakthrough in understanding our kids are not just Spanish speakers. Our ELL kids are not just, they are exposed to two languages. That's almost the majority of the kids we identify as dual language learners or English language learners are really exposed to two languages. Now, there are, mo there are different ways in which they're exposed, but they're really learning two languages. So if we're going to assess them, if we're going to understand them, if we're going to create educational environments for them, then we need to understand that. They really are bilingual. They really are bilingual. So that's a critical landscape change. We've understood this, not only that there are many of them, but they're really in this country, most of them citizens, and most of them uh, essentially exposed to more than one language. Native language of the mother, if not the family, as well as the language of the country, uh, English. What other things have changed? Well, what we know now, essentially, is that the cognitive aspects of being a dual language speaker are really quite interesting. So we know enough through either brain science, I'm a I talked about that, where we sometimes just think bilingualism is just language. No, it's really about knowing lots of other things, including how the brain is structured. Do we know now that there are epigenetic effects? That is, the functions and the structure of the brain is actually changed if you are a bilingual. Now, the interesting, nice things about it, as some of my senior colleagues have pointed out, I mean, colleagues who study seniors, let's put it that way, is that you, know, you can put off Alzheimer's by about five years if you're bilingual. But if you're a three and four year old, or a two and three and four year old, your brain is actually changed because you're exposed to more than two languages. The, fun, the structure of the brain, and that's because the prefrontal lobe, our neuroscientists tell us, is challenged by young children having to deal with multiple symbol systems and make sense of it. That prefrontal lobe, challenged in that way, actually restructures the neurophysiology of the brain. I'd say to many of my preschool dual language teachers, you thought you were just teaching. You're actually a brain surgeon. You're actually changing the structure of the brain. Now, that structure of the brain change now has benefits that are cognitively and social emotionally in favor of the child. On the cognitive side, we know now, at age three, four, five, all the way up to age eight or nine, we see kids who are essentially brought up bilingually. By the way, controlling for SES, these are some poor kids, okay? as well as middle class kids as well as upper class kids who are brought up bilingually essentially do have certain cognitive advantages. They seem to be able to structure problems and focus better. Why does a bilingual focus better? What we call executive function. How, why do they use executive function better? Because you know what, they have to pay attention. If someone is speaking to them in two languages, they have to actually have to discriminate between those two languages. That is a particular challenge to the prefrontal lobe, restructures the brain, and when you bring on another problem, that bilingual is better focused in determining what's important and what isn't in that environment. So we have cognitive function, uh, executive function advantages in areas that have to do with linguistics, with language, with numeracy, and other developmental features. How about social emotionally? This is how kids get along with other kids. You know, dual language kids, we learned in a study at ACLSB that we did, dual language kids, kids who are exposed to two languages at home, who are in preschool, are less likely to get kicked out of preschool. Now, you don't think that's significant, but why do you get kicked out of preschool? Because you bite somebody. You fight, some, you fight, you get kicked out. It takes a lot more to get kicked out of high school than to get kicked out of your four-year-old preschool. And guess what? These kids who are exposed to two languages, socially, emotionally, are able to handle children who are not like them. <laughs> put up with them, put up with teachers, 
put up with the environment that essentially challenges them to recognize differences and to adapt in those social emotional environments. Is bilingualism a benefit to those children, to those students? Absolutely. We know that now. We know that now, social, emotionally. So we have these benefits. Now what else has changed our notion? I talked about the research. Well, when I wrote my first book way back, <laughs> way back in, I think 1982 it was published, I did a research literature and I found in that year probably about five experimental articles dealing with bilingualism. And I was at, I was at Harvard. I went to the finest libraries. Well, about 10 years later, I, went, I told you I went to Obemla. It was, this was in the uh, mid-90s. And I had my staff do an analysis of what we knew about bilingualism. And that year, we did a one-year search, and we found about 20 articles written about bilingualism. These are good research articles, and maybe about three or four books that were written in one year. Last year, last year, we did a search. I'm affiliated with the National Center on Dual Language Learning at the University of North Carolina. And uh, we don't do the searches anymore. We have the graduate students do the searches. You know, postdocs do the searches, you know. They found in a year and a half period that they did a literature review just on literacy, over 140 articles published internationally on bilingualism. You know how many books were published? 17 books. One of them was mine. 17 books published in, a, in an 18 month period. Can you imagine now what we have in terms of a knowledge base? So we begin to wonder what have we developed? I remember when I used to come before a crowd like this and say, the research tells us this. And then I used to say, evidence tells us this. Now we have developed such a field around bilingualism that I can come to you and say, the science of bilingualism tells us what, because we built up such a knowledge base that we now have a science. It's from a developmental science perspective, a learning science perspective. So we're not talking through our hats anymore, ladies and gentlemen. We have a science about this. Now, has it been translated and put directly into practice in many places? No. Has it been directly placed into policy? I'm from Arizona. I can tell you no. In Arizona, they think you could become uh, you know, monolingual from being bilingual in one year. That's the law. That's the law. So we have a long ways to go, but I need to say to you as a researcher, I am very proud that the field has developed a science, a science, a knowledge base that is so rich that you can call it now not just research, not just evidence, but you can call it a science of what we know. Now, I do want to try to translate that science, that landscape change about bilingualism to things that might be important to you. So being bilingual in and of itself, we need to understand, doesn't just generate the benefits. There are things, there are things that we do with our children and our families that are critical in developing bilingualism. Let's talk about vocabulary. Vocabulary. So if you read the latest studies on English language development and English vocabulary development, you would come to the conclusion, and other colleagues have, that our ELL or DLL students at the beginning of kindergarten are about 1,000 to 1,500 vocabulary item behind normal kids. By third grade, vocabulary is almost 2,000 to 2,500 vocabulary items below the English norms. Now let me tell you a study which said, let's take a look at Spanish and English combined, or Chinese and English combined. Guess what? The vocabulary numbers are equal. <laughs> We've been measuring, we've been measuring English vocabulary development in our bilingual students, not recognizing the significance of the other language, which is their primary language in most cases. And if you add the two vocabularies together, they're no different. If you equate them by socioeconomic status. So yes, poor kids have less vocabulary, but bilingual poor kids don't have less than English monolingual kids if you add the two together. Now, some cases, there may be three languages. Add them all together. You've got to remember, these kids are operating and learning in two languages. 
it's inappropriate to think of their vocabulary or their development of academic language or what I would call academic discourses unless we understand those in both languages or all the languages that they speak. Yes, it's cumbersome. Yes, we have to think out of the box in a sense. And no, it isn't the case that just English is important. In fact, if you put those together, it's very critical. Let me give you an example of, of uh, at least one study of some of my colleagues who are uh, Foundation for Child Development, young scholars. They follow a set of kids in Florida. And some of you may be here from Florida, Cuban. Cuban kids do a lot better in Florida than Mexican kids do better. But guess who's doing better than the Cuban kids in Florida? The Venezuelan kids are doing better. So if you longitudinally follow a young child coming at six or seven years old from Venezuela, they go into Cuban, particularly Miami, southern uh, South Florida, uh, schools, after three or four years, they're outperforming everyone. Why? By the way, they came in as ELLs. They came in as bilingual students. They're just learning some English, but mostly Spanish. What makes a difference? Their moms have an education at a higher level in, from Venezuela. It's in Spanish, by the way. It's in Spanish. They speak Spanish. See? Doesn't matter. The issue is that not that our kids do not get enough English. It's that our kids don't get enough rich language, whether it's Chinese, Navajo, Spanish, or English. So they need that rich language environment. What is correlated with rich language environments is education. It doesn't matter where. It can be in China. It can be in Venezuela. It can be in Peru. But all that translates, essentially, to high levels of academic performance, even though it may be in a language other than English. So when a parent tells me, particularly a pre-K parent tells me, quiero que mi hijo aprenda el inglés inmediatamente, I don't want them to learn Spanish. And I have to say to them respectfully, as, by the way, some, some programs like Avance, like the NCLR Early Childhood Program, like Abriendo Puertas does here in California many places, it respectfully says, you are the child's first teacher, and if you can teach them best in your native language, do it because it pays off later in English, okay? In a recent study that we did, 400 sites, 400 parents across the country, three different sites, looked at what parents actually do. There's a myth about our dual language parents, is that is they don't do school stuff with their kids. Guess what we found? They do do school stuff with their kids. They do read to them. Wow, they read to them? They talk about the letters? They talk about numbers? They just don't do it very often. They just don't do it very often. So what's the Clinton Foundation doing? The Clinton Foundation is essentially providing through Univision promos that say to parents, you're doing this already, just do it a little more. <laughs> just do it a little more. And do it in your language, en español, en español. What that does developmentally is build essentially what I would say the benefits of bilingualism, the benefits of that bilingual uh, child that I talked about, the cognitive benefits, the social, emotional benefits, and eventually the benefits of essentially doing good academic work in a second language. In the United States, that's English. So all that essentially is important. What else do we know from that data? What else is important? We know that immigration circumstances are important. I told you, it's just not all about language. In fact, we have many first and second and third generation children in our country today, and we're getting them still. No matter what they do to build those fences, in Texas and Arizona, or even in California, no matter what you do, we're going to get those kids. Remember, 27% are already born here in this country, so they're already citizens. But we're going to get, get these children who essentially are from immigrant circumstances. It's important, we know in our research now, to recognize where these kids come from, particularly their immigrant circumstances. In some places, in the United States, like Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Diego, immigration is common. I mean, I'm sorry, but the superintendent this morning said, we have 
One of them, we have 70 dual language programs. Well, you don't have 70 dual language programs in Minnesota. You don't have them in Nebraska. You don't have them in Oklahoma. They're new sites of immigrants coming into those countries and various sets of immigrants. So we have immigrant centers like Chicago, like New York, like Miami, where we have been doing this for a while. Those of you in those places know, but you've got places like Iowa and Nebraska, South Dakota, Georgia, North Carolina, where immigration has had triple digit increases, particularly Latinos, particularly Mexicanos. And so you don't have the support structures. You don't have all the stuff that parents and families may need. Now, some of you are building those in these immigrant, new immigrant centers. Some of them, of you have got, have established, I mean, San Diego has so much immigrant support, it's amazing. There's won prizes for it. It's in what we call immigrant, immigrant integration. These kids who are living in immigrant circumstances are essentially living in circumstances that are critical to their education, their learning of bilingualism, and essentially, eventually, how they do in school. So we can't just take a bilingual who's coming to us and, and understand them very completely without understanding their own circumstances. And one of those circumstances in the US we learned is their immigrant circumstances. First and second generation kids, that means they're born in the United States, but they have parents who are here, came from outside the United States, either first generation or been there second generation. Kids are citizens. Most of the kids, most of the students in the United States are in our dual language programs or bilingual programs are US citizens. Most of them are, about over 80%. The younger you go, the more. Under five years of age, 93% of the kids are US citizens. They're born in the US. They're not brought across the border. However, they're living in those immigrant circumstances. First and second generation kids they exemplify something we call, in, in the jargon of, of, uh, of a sociologist, uh, the, uh, the paradox, the paradox that actually some of these kids are in better shape physically, intellectually, and socially than our third generation kids. The fact that they're speaking Spanish at home, that they're connected to their families, essentially seems to disappear by end of second generation to beginning of third generation. And we have to understand. So if you ask a first generation, Mexican mother, as we have. What do you think is going to make your child successful in the United States? What do you think is going to make it successful? 94% of those moms that we asked, first generation moms, and even second generation mom, 94 said educación, education. By third generation, it drops to 50%. Okay, it's no longer the schools. They don't trust you. They don't trust us. They've been through the schools. The schools haven't served them well, it passes on to their kids. This where you get this disjunction, this, this, this mis, uh, mismatch between what can actually support language development, cognitive development in the home, if in fact we want essentially this coupling of school and family and home and community. And that coupling by third generation seems to be gone. By first and second generation, they love you. They can't get enough school. They can't think more highly of the teacher, of the school. By third generation, you've got a different situation. And bilingualism is no longer a benefit. <laughs> no longer a benefit. See? So I told you, it wasn't just about language. The last thing I want to say to suggest that it's not just about language, I sort of hinted at it when I talked about the Florida work from our colleagues. And that is that essentially poverty, as Alma Florida talked about this morning, poverty is clearly a powerful phenomenon, powerful variable in influencing bilingual development. Access the poverty situation, uh, poverty, living in poverty situation affects lots of things, including language and literacy development. But, but our data show not the case as strongly for first and second generation immigrant populations. 
It is not poverty that predicts their development of two languages. It is not poverty that solely predicts that. It is the educational capital that is available to those children. So, some of you know, many of our immigrant populations come to the United States. They start their own businesses. They're entrepreneurs. Our business community will tell you that. They're entrepreneurs. Whether it's a restaurant, or whether it's mowing your lawn, or whatever, building that fireplace, they work hard. Work is not a problem. Uh, if you compare, essentially, the educational capital of those kids in those families that actually income is pretty good. Medium family income might be 50, 60,000 a year. But the educational capital available to those children in that home is probably a mother with less than an eighth grade education, a father with a ninth grade number of years of education. You compare socioeconomically to a parent who may be only making 30 or 40,000 but has a high school education, you get a jump in academic performance and bilingual development. Education is a critical aspect of this, not how much money you make. I know we hate to tell our immigrant population, it's okay if you're poor, <laughs> as long as you're educated. The two in this country usually go together, education and essentially moving out of poverty. But for many of our immigrants, they are able to move out of poverty, but aren't able to deal with getting their kids being successful in school. And that's the critical, and that's why schools are so important, including starting early in preschools. Starting early in preschools. So that essentially gives the parents an augmented access to educational capital that they cannot provide the child. That is important in bilingual development, in the development of literacy bilingually, and eventually again in the academic discourses which the child must essentially acquire later on in the schooling experience, whether it's in dual language program or in programs that move the child into English. So this complicates this notion of bilingualism and its benefits. We're clearly at the point in our research in which we can argue pretty clearly from the science that children growing up in bilingual environments, certain kinds of bilingual environments, ones you could provide for these kids, ones their families can provide for them, once they know they can do that, those essentially assist in the benefits of bilingualism. Now what do we know from the educational standpoint makes a difference for the benefits, getting these benefits of bilingualism? Well, first we know teachers are critical. All the way up through eighth grade. We lose that effect, by the way, in middle school and high school. Let me tell you how critical it is. I was a dean of a school of education. In fact, I've been a dean of three schools of education. But what I would say to, to our teachers is that they're very important, critical, but they're particularly critical to this population of students. So we did an analysis. We looked nationally at data, looking at achievement that relates to who is actually teaching these kids. Now here's what we found. In terms of achievement, we found that in third grade, fifth grade, and beginning at first grade, the teacher was absolutely critical. In fact, accounted for 40% of the variance in those situations where the child was identified as a bilingual student, or an ELL student, or a dual language learner. 40% of the variance. When you run that data for English-speaking middle-class kids, you know what amount of the variance the teacher accounts for for those kids, 22%. Who's most important to these kids? <laughs> the teachers and the teachers they get. By the way, it works both positively and negatively. You get a good teacher and you're one of these kids, 40% of your achievement. You get a bad teacher, just the reverse. Those of you teaching these kids, and I would say now, with the empirical data to support it, if I were a college dean, dean of education, I would say, you want to make a difference, go teach these kids. 40% of what you do is going to be related to their outcomes. You go to a middle-class suburban district and teach English-speaking kids, you will donate 
you will benefit them by about 20%, 22%. Where do you want to be? Well, it's where you are if you're serving these kids. You are essentially the critical aspect that tends to account for almost half of the learning, almost half. Many of these kids that other, other uh, teachers are teaching bring a lot of that stuff with them or get it outside of school. These kids get it in school. Okay, they get it in school. That's why schools are critical for us. Now, having said that, where in the continuum is the most critical? Where do we have to intervene if we're going to get the benefits of essentially bilingualism? Starting early. The only data we have, and believe it or not, it's out of Oklahoma. I met somebody here from Oklahoma just a while ago, from Tulsa. Tulsa, Oklahoma, why couldn't it be San Diego, California, or Chicago, or New York, it's Tulsa. Immigrant Mexican kids going to a universal pre-K, essentially getting to start early. These first generation kids, they're born in the US, but their parents born outside, coming to Oklahoma. What does that data show? Because it's a nice comparison of those kids who did a year of preschool, four year at age four to five, and those kids who didn't get into preschool just because they were three days or one week not old enough to benefit. So nice control group. For researchers, we like those control groups. We love them. One year of preschool eliminated, eliminated the achievement gap. One year. We haven't done that at third grade. We haven't done it at fifth grade for our dual language learners, our bilingual students. We don't have, we may have an isolated case where a program may have done that, but in this case, we know we've eliminated the achievement gap. Most dual language learners in the United States begin, according to ECLSK data we've cut, begin at least six months behind other kids as they enter kindergarten. Not in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They start even, even. Now we're getting that data now from California. We're getting that data from Texas. Now there aren't universal pre-K programs yet, but there are much more state programs. So if I had to say, as a developmental psychologist, somebody who studies academic learning, somebody who really crunches that data, who thinks about what makes a difference, who understands that bilingualism is more than just language, it's essentially starting early that it's going to help our children. If you don't have, if you don't have a pre-K in your school or your district, get one. Work with somebody who has them. Because we know, again, in order to get the reading at third grade that we so much want, the high school graduation, it doesn't begin when you're six years old. It doesn't begin when you're 13 years old. It begins when you're three and four years old. And by the way, in the United States, 69% of parents of middle income backgrounds send their kids to preschool. Almost 80, 69 to 70%. For many of our dual language, it's about 42%, 42%. So those who need it the most are getting it the least. Talk about equity. Talk about where we need to go. I'm so happy that President Obama has said universal pre-K for our nation, not just for Illinois, not just for Texas, not just for New York, but for our nation. Why? It's an equity issue. And for our kids, the benefits of who they are, of who they are, and their bilingualism essentially is exacerbated by starting early, by starting early, maximizing the benefits of the bilingual a phenomena that I've been talking about. One other piece of research to share with you. Remember, I'm a psycholinguist. I was trained. I was looking at language. Then I started to say, where is this child really learning language? In many places, of course, it's outside school. Outside school. It's in families. And many of our dual language learners, our bilingual students, have families. Not only do they have families, they're three times more likely to have extended families. More than two adults living in the home. It's a good developmental perspective. It's crowded, don't get me wrong. Homes with more than two adults are crowded, but that means there are more adults watching out for those kids, talking to those kids, 
right? Challenging those kids and making sure they stay out of trouble, too. So in any case, we found if we ignore what goes on in families, if we ignore what goes on in families, we have a problem in realizing the benefits of our bilingual children. In fact, I talked about 40% of achievement being associated with teacher and what the teacher does with those students. About 15 to 20% of achievement is related to what goes on in the families. What goes on in the families. Now, to those of you who are teaching bilingual students, you thought it was just about language. <laughs> it's not. It's about the brain. I told you, it's about the brain. It's about understanding immigrants and those immigrant circumstances. And it's also about understanding the families of these children. Unless your curriculum, unless your instruction, unless how you think of the world essentially does not include those variables, if all you're worried about is language, good luck. Good luck. Because you could take 40%, but what about the others? What about the others? Critical. The last thing I'll say is curriculum and experiences that build on the child's language and culture. Does the child see themselves in what it is you are trying to teach? Alma spoke about it much more uh, appropriately than I got. You cannot teach a child without recognizing where they come from. And the child will not learn as well if your own experiences and what you present does not reflect who they are. Who they are. Good literature. Alma's good literature. Other good literature that has them in it. I, keep, I tell my grandkids, they're 10 years old now, that the first time I saw myself in a book was Rudy Acuna's Bless Me Ultima. The first time I read a book in which I could identify with the character. Most other times, even Batman, Captain America, I don't care. I mean, I, there were heroes, there were other good books, but no one did I, de I cried when I read that book because it was me. And that person was writing about me, and I could feel it. That's what those kids essentially get. And we know it adds about 10% to achievement if you have that kind of experience and curriculum that reflects who the kids are. Now, I've talked about data. Now, I, I, I am a professor, and I said I deal not only in research and science, but part of science is theory. Part of science is theory. And so I'm going to, I can't, bear with me. Yeah, I can't talk theory. I get from Berkeley and ASU and Harvard and all those places. I talk about theory. You all have theories. I'm not talking about beliefs. You have theories. You have theories. My mom had a theory. My mom had a theory. She said, mijo, you got a problem, you face something, pray to the Virgen de Guadalupe. Yeah, it's her theory. And she says, and if that doesn't work, you say the rosary, and you pray the Virgen de Guadalupe. And if that doesn't work, you light a candle, and you do, okay? And I've done all that, by the way. Yeah, that's a theory. She said, that's the way the world works. Okay? So it's the world works. My dad had a theory. Probably much like your parents have theories. My dad, like probably some of your dads have a theory. It's work hard, mijo. Work hard. And if you don't, if that doesn't work, work harder. And you know if that doesn't work, you know what you got to do? Work hard. Work hard. And I've done that as well. So you all have theories. And you all have a theory, whether you like it or not, about how these kids learn language. And much of it is related to just language. I'm asking you to spread that out. Spread that out. That theory's got now to be much more inclusive and comprehensive and understand the circumstances of that child. And most significantly, thanks to developmental systems theory, it says start where the child is, recognizing the strengths that that child brings. And they bring them. Don't you think they don't? I already told you. Esos inmigrantes pobrecitos, they're not pobrecitos. The immigrant paradox says, 
<laughs> you're maybe better off. They all bring those strengths. Now, we have a theory. We have a science, a sense that supports this. Start, if you want to intervene, start where the child is, recognizing and building on those things the child already brings to the table. We have a tendency in education, particularly with our bilingual students, we're certainly getting over the notion that bilingualism is not a good idea, but we certainly still haven't gotten to the point of saying, what are they really bringing to us? And how do we essentially use that to bake them where they've got to go? Yes, the common core. Okay, Kenji, we'll do common core, all right? Okay, we'll do that. But we start where they are. And if they come in Spanish and Chinese and whatever, then you start. They come with a certain cultural set of attributes. They come with respect. They come with all those. Take it and move it. That's what developmental systems are. And that's what the science now supports. That's why bilingualism, theoretically, conceptually, starting with child who are bilingual, building that bilingualism is good. Is good for them. We know now the benefits. And we understand if we want to get them somewhere else, we'll have to build on that infrastructure that they already bring, doing that. Now, we have the theory. We have the science. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it? Well, all of those of you who come to Nabe, I'm sure, are going to go home and do it if you're not already. For about 90% of you, I think all I've done is reaffirm what you already know. <laughs> and if I've done that, great. All I can did, I've given you the science to support what you're doing, great. For those of you who don't have that, you may need to change your theory. You may need to change your theory because we weren't going to change your adult behavior until you have changed the theory in your head. So what I've hoped for you, if you don't have that already, is I mess with your mind a little bit because that's what you gotta do. It's not just about giving you some skills. Go out and do interactive journals. Go out and do cooperative learning. Those things do work, no doubt about it. We know that. We've got the, the science to support that for bilingual kids, absolutely. But you've got to start essentially with the intellectual notions of what is it that I understand this development and this teaching to be about. And unfortunately, you organize your instructional strategies, your lessons, your classroom based on those theories. And those of you who are going to say, well, I'm not sure I have any theories. You have them. Examine them. And when I ask you to think about developmental systems theory that is built on now a science that depends heavily on what we know about bilingual development. Start where the kids are and the strengths they bring and your success with those students will be essentially so much greater. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm so glad you're here, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you.